before I get started, I kind of just wanted to get a feel for the kind of skill level with closure that we have in the audience today. So I'm just going to ask, raise your hand if you have, let's say, less than 50 hours of coding in closure. OK. Well, so we got a good hand of that. OK. And some people who have a bit more. Um, this talk is, talk is, is focused on uh, kind of the new, people new to closure or completely new to closure. Uh, but maybe for those of you that have been working with it for quite a while, you might learn something new as well. Fantastic. All right, let's get started. So for someone who's new to Clojure and wants to learn Clojure and do and, and work like most uh, experienced pro uh, Clojure's programmers work, Clojure asks quite a lot of them. Um, especially if you come from a background working in languages that have a C-like syntax, that are object-oriented, and where you just kind of write code, compile or restart the thing, and see what's going on. Um, Clojure is quite different, and almost the entire programming experience is a little different. There's the syntax, which, you know, Clojure has a lot less syntax than most other languages, but it is different, and so that's an obstacle and something uh, someone new to Clojure has to kind of get over and learn. Then, like with any language, there's figuring out and understanding what are the things that are available to me, what are the libraries, but even specifically what are the functions available to me in the standard library. Since Clojure is a Lisp, Clojure programmers don't really think of code as lines in a text editor but instead they usually think of it as shapes and as the S expressions themselves and typically they work with them directly and so one of the things that you should learn is how to work with a, like, with a structural editing program like Peredit so that you can start thinking about your program in terms of structures as opposed to just text. Also, the REPL is a core integral part of how you work with Clojure. In some of the previous talks you might have seen, People don't just like completely restart their program, and, they, and it's not even like, let's say, like Ruby or, or, or IRB or Node, where you type into this other REPL thing that's running. Typically, you want to set up your system so that you can evaluate code at any time inside of your editor. And see, these are all very kind of different experiences from the mainstream type uh, programming experience. And then the other component is idiomatic style. It's trying to uh, change how you think about programs and program in the way that a given language um, intends. And in Clojure, that is also not mainstream. Um, it's, Clojure is a functional programming language. We'll talk about it being data-driven. And these are both things that are quite different than the rest of other programming languages. And that's the part of, that I'm going to talk about. So it's these big idioms. It's how do you think about the entire program? How do you organize? How do you problem solve? Um, less so than like little idioms when we talk about programming languages, which is things like, oh, okay, should I be using um, this kind of function or this kind of function in this situation? Oh, should I use partials or like other little tricks? That kind of stuff, like syntactical level stuff, I'm not going to cover. I'm mostly going to be thinking, talking about kind of uh, the, the larger idioms of how do you approach generally your programs and kind of what do we like in, in our programming and what do we avoid? So really, the, you know, I call the talk Solving Problems the Closure Way. I could also call it basically Thinking in Closure. And when we talk about Closure, really Thinking in Closure means thinking in a functional programming way and a data-driven programming way. And I'm going to try to get you a good intuitive understanding of what these two things are. Because if you're not used to writing in a functional way, or you're not working in a data-driven way, you might just have a surface understanding. Like when I ask someone who had, doesn't really do functional programming, oh, you know, what do you think of what's functional programming, they usually either give me two answers. One is something, something lambda calculus, um, which, yes, kind of true, but as a practitioner, I don't know what lambda calculus really is. I've been writing closure for like six or seven years, and lambda calculus is not you know, is not something that I really care about at all. And the other thing that people typically say is, oh, right, Haskell. Haskell is functional, right? Um, and so anything that looks like Haskell, that's functional programming. 
And that's also not accurate because Haskell, you know, it is functional programming, but it's also um, very pure functional programming and it is uh, very strictly typed. And working in a strictly typed language is very different than in Clojure, which, uh, which is, very, is dynamically typed and doesn't really, you know, we'll talk, we'll talk about this later, we don't really think about types almost at all. And it's a very, very different experience. So it's sometimes hard to extract, you know, what in Haskell and what about the experience of Haskell is functional programming and what is wrestling with the type system. Um, so we'll talk about those. Now, whatever I'm gonna say is not really authoritative. You know, nobody gets to say what closure is and what idiomatic closure is, not even Rich Hickey. Um, you know, idiomatic style of, is kind of decided by the community and by libraries, by what people write and what people complain about and things like that. So this talk is really my attempt at distilling what closure is or what people like or how people like to write closure in 2019. And I say in 2019, because if I was giving this talk four or five years ago, it would have been a little different. And probably if I were to give this talk in another three or four years, it again would feel a little different because styles of writing change over time. And we'll see that actually. Because this whole data-driven thing, I probably wouldn't have been talking about it much four or five years ago. To better understand these, both functional programming and data-driven programming, I'm gonna, as part of this talk, work through a toy problem. So I'm gonna throw up some code on the screen, and it, we don't need to understand it all. Um, it's mostly gonna be like about the shapes and the look of the code, and I'm gonna be highlighting certain things. And I will be doing these examples actually in JavaScript and not Clojure. So you might be disappointed that you wanna see Clojure code at a Clojure conference, but I'm choosing JavaScript so that, for those of you who aren't familiar with Clojure syntax, you, the syntax doesn't get in the way. It just looks like, you know, your looks like C, looks like Java, looks like JavaScript. These, all these languages kind of have similar concepts and ideas. And JavaScript is fortunately flexible enough that I can show off these various concepts and techniques. Um, but then, you know, if you're interested, I encourage you to convert these things to closure afterwards. But, you know, this talk is about thinking in closure, but not necessarily writing in closure. Okay, so the example we're gonna work through um, is implementing this game called GOPS. It stands for Game of Perfect Strategy. It's also called Goosepeel. It's a pretty simple game. It's not really very fun in person, but it's simple enough for us to implement. And the way it works is that you take, let's say, a deck of cards and you s split it out into the suits and you give one player uh, one of the suits, so all the cards in one suit. You give another player all the cards in another suit and then you take the third um, suit and you set it aside for use as bounties and the fourth suit we throw away. We don't need it. Um, and this is a, the way we're setting it up is just as a two-player game. And so what happens is that every turn we draw one of the random bounty cards, so in this case that's like the ace, and then each player simultaneously chooses one of the cards in their hand and plays it, and then whoever has the bigger, hand, uh, with the bigger uh, number wins that bounty. So basically, you see a bounty, and then the players must decide out of the cards that they have which one to choose. It's a, you know, they, they use this game in like academic settings to like talk about you know, strategy and, and stuff like that um, because it's a perf you, there's perfect information because you know exactly which card, what numbers you have and you know what numbers the other player has and you're just kind of betting and figuring stuff out. And, um, but it's pretty simple. Now if we were to think about, okay, how do we solve this? in a kind of a classic standard imperative way. So if we you know, go back, you know, not even object oriented, how do we do this? And we might you know, set up something to store the cards, so the three kind of sets of three arrays of cards, and then we might have a loop that goes through each turn and you know, does the stuff in order to make the game go. So let's actually take a look. I, I did a quick implementation. Well, actually before that, um, our goal for this is gonna be to run one game and have it print out something like this. You know, on turn zero, the bounty was one, player zero played uh, their six, the player one played their one, and so on and so forth. Final, at the end, we print out the score, and who won? So that's our goal. And we might, in an imperative way, implement it kind of like this. 
I don't expect you to have to read it, but I'll kind of briefly go through the idea. Can, you guys can see my cursor? Nice, okay. So we have a function called run game. It sets up a bunch of variables here. You know, we're keeping track of the turn because we're gonna need to print it out. We keep track of the bounty cards. I'm only doing eight for e in, the, in each suit. Uh, the players also each start with eight. Their scores start at zero. And then we have a while loop. While we still have bounty cards left to take, um, we kind of play each turn. Uh, we randomly pop one of the bounty cards. That's a helper function over here. Then we print out what the turn number is and which bounty we, we just chose. And then we've implemented two separate strategies for the players. So one player is gonna play randomly. So they're just gonna draw a random card. And the other player is going to always play the card that they see. These are the kind of, I chose like the simplest strategies just so that we don't have to write a lot of code for this one. We increment the turn. And then based on whose card was higher, we give that person the score, we increment their score by that bounty card. And then we do a bunch of printing at the end to uh, print their scores, because this is outside of the loop, we print their scores and who, whether, who won and, or if there was a tie, because it's possible to have a tie. I guess I'll mention, just because it's not you know, immediately clear, that if there is a tie, if, we both, if both players played the same card, in the, I'm just doing nothing, so neither of them get the bounty. I mean, there you could play the game with different variations, but that's the way I've chosen here. So this makes sense, and it's fine. And you know, if this was a, all that you had to do, it'd be okay. It's not terrible. And you know, that's the problem with toy examples and short examples, is that you don't really feel any of the pain of this kind of style of programming because it's only like 50 lines of code. Um, but with imperative programming, you know, that was the kind of initial style of programming where we would just change things, or like every almost line of our code, its purpose is just to increment some value or change some variable somewhere. Um, but many, many years ago, as projects got larger, people felt that this style has limits, especially as programs get larger, um, you start handing, hitting kind of limitations in terms of, you know, we now have state all over the place, what's happening here, what are my variables are being swapped out by someplace else, and like it, it becomes hard to understand. So there was kind of actually a schism in the, in the programming community in terms of how to solve this, and we kind of have this idea of like, okay, well, a large amount of the community went towards this idea of object-oriented programming, and then the folks here um, would know that there was also another community of people that instead uh, would recommend doing functional, a functional programming approach instead. So let's take a look at how an object-oriented programmer would approach this problem instead. So OOP practitioners would say, yes, the problem is state. We think, you know, any of these values and variables, if they're being changed all over the place, that gets confusing. So let's organize that better. And to do that, we've given you, we're giving you a new tool, objects. So you can combine your state into, and some methods, you can, well, you can separate your state into different kinds of things, um, and you can have methods that only work on the, those pieces of state, and we call those objects. And now, now that you have objects, you start thinking about programs not just as a series of steps and mutations of values, but kind of as a system of interacting agents or things that communicate with each other, pass messages, or, um, or provide services for each other. Like when I worked in object-oriented programming, this is kind of what's happening in my head, right? Now, if you're being very careful and organized in how you do object-oriented programming, you might want to make sure that kind of there's only a single direction in which kind of a hierarchy of your objects, but occasionally you do end up in a kind of just like a graph kind of problem, situation. So as an object-oriented programmer, if I looked at the imperative code and looked at that problem, I would say, you know what, we should create a game class that will take care of the outer loop and play the turns. We should have players and the players will keep track of their, each player will keep track of the scores and each player and will have a deck of cards whose job is to just kind of help keep that list of cards and allow you to remove or add things to it. And the game would also have this deck of cards. And so I've taken the code from before and just highlighted kind of how an object-oriented pro uh, object programmer 
would say, oh, you know what, you're, you're mixing concerns here. There's a bunch of stuff here that would better fit with cards and, or a bunch of stuff that would better fit into a player. And so they would, want, they would suggest refactoring this and splitting it out into these different classes and objects. Now, thanks to the advances in JavaScript, and quote unquote advances in JavaScript, we now have classes and class syntax in JavaScript. So we can actually do this. So I'm gonna magically refactor this code into those classes. And so here we have the game class, still has the play turn and play game, and it's all very, very similar looking code. When I, when I was doing this, it was literally just like copy, paste, copy, paste. It's almost all identical, except in a bunch of places we now have like this dot whatever for the state. So the game state here is a list of players that are player objects, um, the list of cards, and the, um, the turn. Player objects, they just keep track of their score and their cards, and there's some methods to help increment and work with the score. And we have two separate implementations of the play card method, whose job is to pick for each player which card they play. And the deck is just really kind of a wrapper around an array that helps work with this kind of list of cards. So you can like remove a card randomly like we had before, or remove a specific card, or check if there are still any cards left in the deck. And the OOP approach has worked quite well. I mean, the industry basically, like, if you think about it, the industry has been dominated by object-oriented programming to the point where, you know, JavaScript added this way of doing things. Um, but it's not without its detractors and it's not without its problems. I'm not gonna go into in depth what, you know, the problems with object-oriented programming are other than to just say that, you know, functional programming does have a completely different set of answers to a similar problem. So when, you know, we, with object-oriented programming, they said, let's organize state, use objects, and think of programs as interacting agents. Functional programming instead agrees state is confusing, but says, let's avoid it. Let's just say state is bad. And when I say state, I mean any values that change in place. So if you have an array, and you want to increment it in an imperative programming language, you just increment that array. And in functional programming, we'd say, you know what, no, that's bad. Because then when this array is being passed to some function and that function changes it and we didn't expect that, things go wrong. Like basically state is the root of all problems. So let's try to avoid it. Now compared to you know, classical imperative programming and functional, programmer, fu functional programming languages also gave us a new tool and that was the function. And that's to distinguish, and we use the word function to really distinguish from the idea of a procedure. And the, the main difference between a function and a procedure is that a procedure, you know, you can declare, you have to give it a name, and you can still pass procedures around maybe by name, you can pass the names of procedures around, but you can't uh, pass a given function that you create dynamically as a value. Whereas with functions, you can. So procedures can't really be passed around by value, and you can't create them on the fly and pass them around, whereas with functions, you can. Now, if you've worked with JavaScript, you know, anonymous functions, um, you know, they're, they're everywhere, and so you're, it's, it's not that crazy of a concept. Um, but at the time, it was definitely something very different. And if you work in a, like a strict object-oriented programming language, they don't really have, um, they don't have these functions that you can just pass around. Sometimes they're, they're also called lambdas, um, but, they don't have them. Like Java only recently, you know, had made it possible to pass around functions on their own, uh, and barely anyone uses that because, you know, why do you need functions? You just have methods on objects. But in functional programming, we say, no, no, we don't need an object. You can just have a function. It can just sit on its own. And the, the model, the mental model of functional programming isn't steps to achieve some solution, isn't interacting agents working with each other, it's really mostly thinking of a program as a pipeline of input to output. We think of, okay, what is the data that our program is gonna be receiving over time, and how do we transform that data into the outputs that we want? Now, you might be thinking, well, we want to avoid state, but mutable state and side effects are inescapable. 
that's kind of almost the point of programming. We want our programs to do something, have some side effect. If all our program did was just make our laptop hotter and then and then they you know contribute to the heat of death of the universe, it wouldn't really be useful. I mean, unless you're cold. Um, but you know, the purpose of programs is to do something, even if at the least it's to print out a single number. If all we wanted to do was take in a bunch of inputs and print out a number, that's still some side effect. It's printing to the console. Um, but you know, this typically, you know, real programs have other side effects that we think about, and it's things like, you know, um, communicating to a database and changing things in a database, sending an email or triggering some other external API, making an HTTP request to another server, um, or writing to the file system. These are all kind of effects that a program, typically what we would want a program to have on other parts of your computer system. So functional programming would say, okay, yes, we do want side effects. And so it's not saying let's get rid of all state, let's get rid of all kind of side effects. Functional program is saying, but let's just do our best to avoid it. And how? How do we avoid it? So how do we avoid mutable states? So values that can change. How do we avoid actually mutating that state in our programs? And how do we avoid all these other kinds of side effects? We can have three, functional programming has like three techniques, three little tricks that um, you can use. And those are minimizing, concentrating, and deferring. So minimizing is just trying to have less, less state, so less values that we're keeping around. Um, concentrating is saying, okay, well, if we have to have values, let's keep them all in one place rather than throughout the program. And deferring, well, we'll, we'll get to deferring because in a moment. And this minimize, concentrate, defer also applies to mutations. So with mutations, we're saying, okay, let's try to have as little parts of our code that actually change values um, in places, so places that change state. And if we do have to have mutations, let's keep them as much together rather than spread throughout the program. And similarly with side effects. Let's try to decrease the amount of places that we do side effects, concentrate the places that we do side effects, and if possible, defer them either to kind of the last step in our program or to a completely separate system. Right? If you think to, about like a database, um, you're not dealing with necessarily doing all this fancy work that the database needs to do in order to keep track of the state and do a query and, and whatever. Presumably there's a whole bunch of state that is necessary from your point of view of using a database. It's just like, here's a command. You figure it out. Talking a bit more about minimizing, how do we minimize state? The tools that functional programming gives us is well, there's a few things we can do. One is we can derive values if possible. So sometimes there might be states that you want to keep, but you could actually completely avoid it. An example I give is, for example, if you were trying to play the game of tic-tac-toe or you know, program a game of tic-tac-toe, you might think, okay, I'm going to have to keep track of whose turn is it. Is it X's turn or O's turn? But actually, you don't need to keep track of that at all because you can determine whose turn it is based on how many, play, um, how many plays, how many grids are already full. So if you're being hardcore f uh, functional, I would say I wouldn't keep track of a vari variable called turn. I would just have a function that, based on the state of the grid, would tell me if it's X's or O's turn. Another technique is to copy data instead of mutating it in place. And you'll see this a lot, and this is a re really fundamental. Because you know, as part of programs, we do want to change data structures. But with functional programming, we just copy them instead. And you might think, oh, OK, that, that sounds crazy. If I have an array of 1,000 items, and I want to add one thing to that array, you want me to make a whole new copy of that array and then add that one thing? That's, that seems incredibly inefficient. But thanks to a bunch of math and computer science and really smart people, we came up with data structures that allow doing that efficiently, uh, which are called immutable data structures. In the case of an array, in functional programming languages like Clojure, if you have an array and you say, OK, add an element to that array, that new array is not a full copy. It's actually just two references, a reference to the original array and to that value. So there's like almost no new memory being used, just like two pointers and that one added value. 
But you might say, oh, but if you were to do that, what if someone changes that original array? Now you're, you know, that the, if you change the original array, then the one that you're, the new array is also gonna change. But no, because we're saying you can't change anything, so it's okay. You can make these derived values of like this array is actually based on this other array that's based on this other array that's based on this other array because the, the systems, the libraries don't let you change those previous arrays. Um, and you might think, okay, well in practice this sounds kind of complicated. Now I have to think of like an array being derived from a previous array being derived from some other thing. But in practice you don't. It just feels like working with any other thing. It's like take an array, uh, concat it with another array. Um, the, in uh, Clojure and most other languages, you have a whole a, a bunch of these data structures, and, but most importantly, you have arrays or vectors, um, you, and you have maps or objects or dictionaries, depending on what language you're talking about. And those two data structures have all the common things that you would want to do with them implemented in an efficient way, in a, fu in a functional way. Another technique we have is using lambdas, or using these anonymous functions. If we create functions uh, dynamically, they will remember values in their scope, and you can make use of that, and we'll see that in a few places. And more importantly, you can also create higher order functions. So typically, the, the examples like map and reduce, super, super you know, everyday functions that you know, I will use absolutely every day that I'm programming in Clojure, and they make, they like map and reduce, for example, get rid of most situations where you'd be using loops, right? If in JavaScript, if you wanted to say, okay, if you, well, if you didn't have map and reduce and filter, which you do in JavaScript, but if you didn't, um, if I asked, okay, you know, find me all the unique items in this uh, array, you'd have to create another array, loop through the first one, and then like a sock stuff into the, into the new array that you created or something like that. Whereas with map and reduce, you just pass a dynamic function and map and reduce do that stuff for you. And under the hood, they do that recursively. And that's kind of our last technique. Um, pretty much every loop solution to a problem has an equivalent recursion solution. And um, we just prefer recursion because you don't actually have to keep track of state as much. The system, you basically defer that problem of keeping track of state, of keeping track of the stack to the, to the compiler and to, um, to your, your language system, to the VM. And so that's one less thing that you have to manually keep track of. So three techniques, minimize, concentrate, and defer. And I'm gonna go through an example of libraries and programs that you might have encountered that actually have done this. So you can kind of see what the difference is in taking a functional approach. So my first example, is jQuery versus React, or the way that jQuery works versus how React, think, you know, how we think in React. In the early days of the web, and the way of when we did things with jQuery, we would be, our programs would be just full of imperative, um, stateful manipulations of the DOM. So in the browser, you just say, okay, take the, find this object, change this thing on that object, and that would be state inside of the DOM. And, all, and if you wanted to, change what the page looks like or whatever, you'd have to keep track or keep checking, what is my current value? What do I need to do to change it? Let's do that to change it. And then React came around a few years ago and said, you know what? Let's not do all these mutations. Let's instead let you write and think about your program as just a series of functions and each function declaring a part of your interface and you chain these functions together to compose your interface. And all of that mutation and figuring out what's currently there and what needs to be there, we'll let the library take care of that. We'll let some external system. And so this is an example of trying to defer, concentrate and defer the stateful stuff. Like it's unavoidable working with the DOM in a browser to do mutations, but we can come up with solutions that let us program as if we didn't have to worry about that. We can program in a pure, a functional way where all we have to do is declare, okay, here's a function that describes this part of the UI, here's another function that describes this part of the UI. As long as you pass some values, it just returns the corresponding HTML, and it's all pure, and all the stateful stuff is taken care of in another part of the system. 
So this is definitely very, very kind of a functional way of thinking about it. Another example in React is this common question of, okay, well, we have some state. We, you know, in order to make our interface work, typically our interfaces have some state to deal with. Where do we put it? And in the early days of React, largely because the dominant idea in, in programming is object-oriented programming, people thought, okay, each component or each part of the, in, uh, the, the React component in the interface should keep track of its own state. And we want to have as much encapsulation and as much separation of concerns in our, in our React systems. So here's kind of our, our tree of you know, DOM elements or React components. And if we had some state that only this component cared about, um, and if we needed to like, show the state and maybe have a function that needed to change that state, we'd keep it just down here. But the problem with this approach is that if there was any point in time where, let's say, one component needed to show something, but another component needed to update it, then our state would have to go to the lowest common denominator, or in this case, it would be kind of like the highest common denominator, um, that, because you know, React only works top down. So we can't keep the state here and make, and make it accessible to this guy. We have to move it up. And in larger and larger programs, what tends to happen is that the lowest common denominator is the root. So there's this effort in this technique of keeping the state as low as possible, but the kind of tidal force or the na natural force of these programs is to try to actually, the, the state moves up and up and up. To the point where a bunch of React practitioners decided, you know what, if this state is trying to go all the way up to the top and we have all this state up at the top and in a bunch of places kind of near the top of our, um, our, our hierarchy, why don't we just shift our thinking and instead, let's just put it all at the top. Let's just have one place. So let's concentrate our state in one place because then the rest of our application is pure. These are pure, dumb, functional components if you, know, you work with React, but basically these things are just functions. They take inputs and they return HTML. They don't change any state, they don't do anything. Um, or when they do change the state, it's all kept in one place. And there has been a shift over the last few years where React started out as the majority of the community doing, doing things this way and shifting towards this technique. But we can go even further here because people realize, okay, this is nice. We now have just one place for all of our state. We don't have to kind of worry about things changing in all a bunch of different places. But it is kind of annoying because now you have to pass everything down. Like if this guy needs something, it needs to be added to the state and passed through all of its parents. And it wouldn't be, and it would be quite typical actually to see in some larger React applications having like 10, 15, 20 things being passed to this guy just so that another five or six can be passed down to this guy and, and so on and so forth. And that becomes a little tedious and you know, hard to read and hard to understand. So the next proposal is, okay, well, why don't we just get it, rip it out? It's a global, we have a single one of them, so why not make it a global object? And people were resistant to this idea because they're, you know, people, it's been beaten to people's heads that globals are bad. And it's true, globals are bad when you have a hundred of them, but globals are perfectly fine when you only have one. And this is the kind of idea that, you know, when I think most large Re React programs now use, and, you, and this is the pattern that Redux follows, which is a library that people use with React. And now the neat thing is that this idea actually didn't come up with Redux. It was one of the things that came out of a closure library called Reframe, which predates Redux. Um, so there's, there's equivalent kind of, there's an equivalent sort of um, issue in closure where we have libraries that wrap React. So the reagent way of doing things, which reagent is a kind of a very um, light wrapper around React, started out as thinking about, okay, let's do things this way, where we have lots of little states and lots of little atoms, little closure atoms that we can modify. But then when Reframe came about, they said, okay, well, let's just, let's just do this, the right-hand side instead. Now, as a functional programmer, what do I think? Well, I think this is very object-oriented, the one on the left-hand side. I actually think the one in the middle is probably the most functional because even though this makes the so ripping it out and moving that state to a global that's accessible everywhere makes it easier to work with, these components are no longer pure. They now kind of get state and access state kind of 
out from somewhere else rather than just being passed in directly via like the function arguments or props. But as a pragmatic functional programmer, I would say, you know what, it's probably still worth it. I'm willing to put up with um, a few little impurities in my code if it makes it net simpler. So you know, if I was a Haskell programmer, I'd probably do the middle. But if I was a closure programmer, I'd be happy with the one on the right hand side. So I mentioned reframe, which is uh, the kind of Redux equivalent. It's this library that helps manage state in a front-end application. And there's also a very interesting example in a change that happened in reframe. So originally, in one of the first, you know, in the first one or two years of reframe's existence, you'd have some code like here. It's closure code, so you can be happy we're at a closure conference. You can see some closure code, um, and this is a code to register an event handler. So something, a, st a state transition, something that like, you know, you click a button and you want to trigger something to happen, you'd, uh, you'd register one of these things to handle that. And so this is a adding product to a cart. And in this situation, when, you know, the user clicks that button and triggers this event, we want to do three things. We want to make an Ajax call to p tell the server, oh, hey, this person added this product uh, to their cart. Um, we might want to dispatch, so trigger some other event to happen. Um, and we want to update our local global state object, which in this case is called DB, um, to indicate that that item has been added to cart. So this seemed fine, but the reframe folks are you know, pretty hard, um, you know, happy about functional programming. And they saw this, and they thought, you know what? This, this, isn't, this isn't functional enough. This could be done better, because here we have three side effects, three things that the, this function is doing that is triggering um, uh, side effects in the rest of our system. Could we do better? And you might think, well, no, but you know what? The whole point of this is to have side effects. But check this out. They eventually came up with something, a new idea. They said, instead of actually calling other side effectful tr functions in your code, like making an AJAX request or triggering another event or a Updating the database. Well, actually, in this case, updating the database, um, this doesn't cause a side effect. This just returns a new database. So it's these two that are the problem, AJAX and dispatch. Let's instead write our functions so that they just return an object that says what I would like to be done. So I would like if calling this event for an AJAX event to happen with the following information. I would like for this other event to be dispatched. And I would like for the database to now look like this. But it doesn't actually do it. This function itself doesn't do those things. It just says, here is what I want to be done. So it's just like declares, these are the things I want to be done. Whereas on the left-hand side, it actually does them. And then the reframe system, other parts of the system, actually take this and do something with it. And this is another example of deferring. Instead of having a whole bunch of these events that actually have side effects and do things, we have these functions just declare what they want done, and we have one part of the system. It's a complicated part of the system. It has to figure out how to do all these things, do all these side effects, but at least it's all concentrated in one place, and the rest of our application is pure and easy to understand and easy to test. Like, if I had to test this, I'd have to test, okay, is the AJAX event actually happening? So maybe I have to, like, mock an AJAX thing or actually just, you know, do an integration test. Um, whereas on this side, I just have to check if the, argue, the thing that it's spitting out is the thing that I wanted. It's, I mean, this is usually kind of trivial, but you can imagine that there might be some complicated stuff that's going on in here, and all you have to do is check, is it doing that complicated stuff? And then let's hope that the person that implemented, or if you implemented the thing that does the AJAX bit, you know, it's a, it's a, it just has to figure out how to do that, and so you can test those things completely separately. So again, kind of another one of these like, uh, example of doing things functionally. So let's go back to our toy example. Here's our object-oriented code. I've removed kind of the syntax hiding. And let's take a look at it from a functional point of view. So if I was a functional programmer, I would like immediately be looking at it in terms of where do I have state? Where do I have var values that change? Where do I have mutations that change these values? And where do I have code that triggers some other side effects like printing or writing to the file system? In our case, it's only console logging like logging to the console that is a side effect. 
And so I would look at this, and I've highlighted you know, mutable state in blue, mutations in orange, and external side effects in green, and what I see is this stuff is spread all over. There's um, state in a bunch of different objects, there's side effects happening all over the place, there's mutations all over the place, and I would say, you know what, object-oriented programming, I don't think you've really made state easier. You've, you've maybe, kind of, well, you know, you've organized it a bit, but it's still a problem. You still have stateful stuff going on all over the place. Taking a look at our imperative example, if we kind of take the functional lens again at it, it's a little better actually, because all of our state is in one place, but again, we have mutations and side effects all over. So, what I'm gonna do in the net for the next like five minutes is I'm gonna try to go step by step and refactor this to be more functional. Because you know, some people ask me, okay, you know, you know, if you're, they're trying to work in a functional way, they think, okay, I need to write from the step one, figure out how do I do this functionally. Well, when I try to teach people how to write functionally, I just say, you know what, it's okay, write it however way you wanna write it, and then you can incrementally tweak it um, to get it where you want, and then eventually you'll develop the habits to try to get it right the first time. So let's, let's do some refactoring. Okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna kind of, you know, we don't have to know exactly what's going on here, so I'm gonna just be kind of ripping out the code and, and, and making transitions so I don't talk for 40 minutes. But here we go. So we have these two console logs here, and perhaps let's concentrate them with all the other ones. Like ideally we would have a bunch of pure functions, functions that just take in some values and return values. And so having this function these, do these two console logs, that's not great. It'd be better if we maybe move them back into our main run game function. So, you know, we're just moving things. We're not decreasing at all, but we're concentrating a little bit. So let's pop them over. And it's a little better. It's, it's not great. Um, let's try to make pop random pure. So this function right now would have taken an array and mutated it to not have the value that was being removed. We can, well, first we should rename it. It's no longer going to be popping. But if we make this one no longer mutate the array, we have to move that mutation somewhere else. So we're gonna bring the mutation back into our outer kind of loop. But if we do that and we kind of rename it in the correct places, we now have select random as pure. So basically any code here that is just white with no highlighting, that's good, it's a good code. Um, and you know we're making this one arguably worse, but in a whole, I th we think it's better because we're concentrating and moving all the bad things like state and state mutations into one place. I also had a, I added a little helper called without that given an array filter stuff out. Some of these things, like there's a whole bunch of helpers that I have to add in this example because JavaScript doesn't have a great standard library for doing these sorts of things. Like half of the functions in JavaScript are m mutate in place and half of them return copies and it's just a complete mess. In Clojure, like I'd say like a good quarter of the code that you're gonna see just doesn't need to be there because you have a function that lets you filter or remove an item from a list or do all these sorts of things without having to resort to writing it yourself. But anyway, we have some helpers there. Um, this next step, we have our, one of our strategies here, one of the player strategies, um, still be stateful, it still mutates by splicing an array, so it removes a value of an array. So let's do the same thing. Let's, move, let's have that function just return a value and do, excuse me, do the mutation back where it was being called. So we can do that, um, and now all of our, these four functions, selecting a random card, playing a random card, um, and then filtering, these are all pure now, and they're no longer interesting. So I'm just gonna collapse them, okay? Because we're gonna need some more space in a sec. But these functions now just do what they say, they don't affect anything else. You can, if you were to read one of these functions, you can ignore the rest of the universe, because all it is is inputs to outputs, nothing else, and that's good. Let's, let's keep going. We have a bunch of console logs and messages here, and the thing that I don't like about this is that there's a bunch of logic in the if statements um, about here. Let me turn on the pointer about um, how to you know decide which message to show, and then actually showing the message. But you have this side effect right in the middle. So let's instead again move the side effectful part, which is the logging, outside, and have a function that determines which message to show. So 
I'm going to create a, sorry. So I create a win message helper function. It's pure. It just takes the scores and it returns a string for what we want to print out. And our console log here now just prints that out. And now that we've done this, we might notice, hey, we have a two console logs together. We might be able to actually just combine them in a similar way. So we create an end message function and a score message function, that you, and, that, that, and they, the end message combines the two together. Let's keep going. We have our state variables, but there's multiple of them. And I'm going to suggest that we combine them into one. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but we'll see in a few moments why that might be helpful. So we're just going to plop them all into one thing. You might think of this as kind of like concentrating. And I had to change a bunch of the code just because now you have to do like state dot, state dot, state dot, state dot, whatever. Not a win yet. But now I would suggest let's, let's maybe create a function whose job is to take the state of the game and give me the next state. That's all it's going to do. And it's going to be pure. So it takes one state and it decides or it determines what the next state of the game should be. So if we were to create this function, you know, we need to, we were gonna, it's going to take some state, and then it's going to return that new state. And actually, we can just like pretty much copy-paste most of the code that was in here, because a lot of it, um, apart from the mutating parts, um, is just using these pure functions that we created. And so what we're doing here is we're taking that state, calculating like the bounty card and the two cards that are being played, and then we're just returning a new value. And if we do that, then you know, we don't need most of this, and we can replace it with still a mutation, but now it's all of our kind of logic for figuring out what to do is in a pure function. It's, it's kind of complicated, but you know, this is the meat of our code right here. This is what defines this game from another game. And uh, now we just have a very kind of simple, we say, okay, well, this, the, the state for the next turn is the previous state transformed by this next state function. But we do have a problem. There was a few places here that we were console logging values that no longer exist. So we need to add them to our state. We realized that we actually had some implicit state that we cared about because it was being generated inside of this loop. So we're going to explicitly put it in our um, state object. So we're going to put those few in the state object, modify our things, and now this is working again. This is looking better. You know, now we have the majority of our code is pure, and we have just a little bit of code here that st still does side effects and um, some state. And you know what? I might stop here. Even if I was writing closure, you could do this with an atom that gets mutated. But I'm going to keep going, because <laughs> there's still more to be done. Uh, once again, we see like these console logs here, a bunch of console logs together. So we could combine the content that they're logging and have a function generate that and have the console log then just call the function to figure it out. So I create a turn message function whose job is to figure out what is it that I want to show um, on each turn, and then I console log it. Again, anytime we're moving code from a stateful, messy, mutation-heavy part of the system to a place where it's just pure and perfect, it's better. So we might not, we're, we're just, we're, we're shuffling things around, but on the right-hand side, everything is pure, and we can take each of these things on their own and understand them exactly on their own, rather than what we had previously, which is we could, we'd have to understand them as part of a large whole, whereas here we can understand them independently. Not done yet. Um, I'm going to suggest, and this is another one of these like maybe crazy suggestions, instead of just keeping track of one state, let's make it into an array. And, so I just turned into an array, and now instead of mutating the one state value, we're just going to append to it. So every time we do a turn, we're just going to append to that array the new state that happened. And again, you might say, oh man, this is crazy. If this was a big game, you'd have a giant data structure of thousands of states and memory, la, la, la. But in a, with functional data structures, it's... It's reasonably efficient. Now, you might not want to do this on a system that's processing way more data than you can store or whatever, but in this kind of system, that, this might be a reasonable choice for you to do. Now that we have it in an array, I'm going to suggest why not split our program into the two, two steps. 
one step that just generates the states and another step that logs, does the actual stateful things. So I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have run game return the states. I'm gonna create a reporting function whose job is to take in states, map over them, so kind of loop over them um, using some function that we're gonna invent in a mi minute. So it's some function that it receives that tells it what to do on each turn and some other function that tells it what to do uh, on, with the last state. So this is our reporting function. And then the way we would run our code is we would just have our run game, which just generates a bunch of states. And then our two functions we already have, turn message and end message. These are our message helpers that we created before. This one decides what to print on each turn and what to print at the end. And once we have that, all this stuff here, all this like console logging we were do doing before is no longer necessary. So this is nice. Now we have no side effects in here and just side effects in here. So we've concentrated and separated, so it's good. And then the last step is, you know, we have this while loop that's adding to an array. We could actually do this with recursion and completely get rid of having uh, any sort of mutable state. Now, again, this part is kind of optional and it's really just like a, Depending on what you're doing, this might be kind of a minor trivial thing. And in Clojure, you actually have like a while loop with a recur, so it looks like you're writing a while loop, but it's implemented with recursion under the hood, or maybe then under the actual in the JVM, it might be to be doing it with um, a loop. It depends on how you think about it, but we're trying to get rid of our code actually doing mutation. It's fine if the system under the hood does mutation. So we can have a function that just recurs, so it takes some states, um, it takes a state change function and an end condition, and it does some recursive calling. And if we use that, then here's what we end up with. A sea of white. You know, if we were to expand, this would be a lot more code, but now, like 95% of our code is pure. All it takes is imp transforms inputs to outputs. By doing this process, we've also semantically kind of identified little responsibilities that are useful, little kind of things like, oh, converting to next state, having an end message determined. And all of these are so easy to test. You just take this function, pass it some state, and check if it returns the value you want. You don't have to mock out some console object or some DB object or whatever. And then, you know, some side effects are inevitable, so we have them over here, just in one little place. So we've gone from this thing that was a whole mess of side effects and mutations and state to no mutating state at all and one little place that takes care of the side effects. And now why is this good? In general, it's because pure functions are good and so we want pure functions everywhere, right? If, 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 if I had to leave you with one core concept of what is functional programming, it's this, this image. Okay, burn this into your minds. <laughs> Functional programming is trying to program with as many f pure functions as possible and then figuring out the details. And like I mentioned, you know, pure functions are good because they're so easy to test. Um, they are uh, so easy to understand because if I look at this function or if I look at any one of these functions, I could ignore the rest of the universe and I just have to figure out how this function is doing what it's doing. Um, they're very easy to test. They're really easy to use in a parallel system if you're trying to parallelize, and they can also be trivially um, memoized. So because given an input, the outputs are all, always the same, you could create a system that says that will cache all of these responses. So there's a, there's, you can look up a fun example of solving like Fibonacci um, recursively, and the recursive solution is like you know n squared and it's terrible and it's pretty slow if you give it like a large number, but the moment you just add caching, which in Clojure, actually, there's a single word. You can, you can have a function and just say memoize function. It turns it into um, kind of the most efficient approach to that problem, and it makes it kind of instant. How's my time? OK. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about data-driven programming. I'm running a little over time, and we started late, so I'm going to go through this a bit faster than I wanted to. 
But closure is also called data-driven. And what does this mean? And there's kind of like data-driven, if you were to ask people, they don't, like, it's not a well-known concept, and it's not really clear what data-driven is, and even people will argue about it, and, and it's not, it's, there's no consensus, really. It's not one of these, like, it's, it's early days in the data-driven world. Um, but there are kind of three things that we mean when we talk about data-driven. One is this idea that when we design our programs, we think about the data. You know, it's, we're, we're doing pipelines of data. Let's think about what is our data, where do we need to move it, how do we transform it? So it's this kind of like data-first thinking approach. But this is kind of like very high level. Um, the second definition or way of thinking about it is the fact that Clojure just uses plain data structures. When you write Clojure code, you don't type, you don't have objects, you don't have like typed structs or things. You're literally just using, you know, vectors and maps and you're passing them around all over the place. Now, people from a typed uh, programming background would think, oh my God, that's crazy. How can you know that things work? But it does. And, you know, there might be some trade-offs, but closure is firmly in the camp of it's better to have just a common, simple way of transferring data around your system rather than typing it all. And the third definition, which is one of the more kind of ones that people typically think of when they do data-driven programming, is this, this idea of programming where data structures define some of our control flow. And so and, you know, an analogy to this is, let's say, macros. You, know, you might say code is data. So you, know, you can take some code and manipulate it with other code to change what you want to do. But actually, the closure community is not a big fan of macros. There's a whole other talk that, you could, um, that I'm going to point you to, to to kind of learn more about that. And instead, what the, the closure community seems to be moving towards this idea of let's use data structures to describe our logic and then have some other code manipulate those data structures and do the things we want. Because data structures are the purest thing you can have. They don't even have behavior. You don't concat things, you don't do things. It's just data. Um, so I like calling this, like my analogy for this and my word that I have for it when I try to explain it to people, it's like configuration-driven development. Like what if you could put more of your program just in a config file of plain data and less of it in like Turing complete code? And a few examples of that, like my favorite example of this is actually um, the AWS SDK. So AWS, if you want to work with AWS, um, you know, you'd probably be using the SDK and, you know, they, Amazon would need to write that same SDK for like 20, 30 different languages. So they came up with this idea of, you know what, let's just describe all the things that you can do with the AWS system in JSON. So they have these, J, so they have this giant list of like 1,000 JSON files um, and each of them describes a part of Amazon's web services and it's literally JSON that says, okay, well, there's this operation you can do on S3 called abort multi-part upload, and here's a bunch of metadata about it. Here are the inputs it takes, here are the outputs, here are the errors, and so on and so forth. And then, in order to write the Ruby library or the Node library, they just need to write a compiler or some sort of system that translates these JSON files into an SDK or library you can use, but they don't actually have to implement every one of these functions in that library. And in this way, you know, that, that's, kind of, that's what they do. When you're using the libraries, they're actually just um, look, being built from these JSON data structures. It's crazy, but it's so much easier to write something that translates this JSON into some code than to have to write all that code and maintain all of that code. And so AWS has a bunch of them that they've written, and then a few months ago, Cognitect wrote the equivalent version for... Um, for enclosure. Two other quick examples of data-driven are how we, how we do, how we write HTML and CSS in Clojure. If you think about, let's say, React and JSX, you have this weird mangle of JavaScript code that turns into HTML code, and then there's, you know, you switch back and forth, and there's a whole bunch of syntax and about how to do that, which, you know, people who work with it are like, oh yeah, this is fine, it makes total sense. I teach students React, and I tell you, it is not trivial. But in Closure Land, we came up with this syntax called Hiccup, where you just use keywords and strings and maps and objects to create your structure of, uh, that corresponds to the HTML. 
and it is absolutely trivial to work with. It makes like perfect sense. There's like no ambiguity, and you can just use all the stuff you're used to using in Clojure, like for loops and things, um, or I guess this is like for is kind of really implemented kind of like as a map to do uh, to generate the data structure that you want, and then later deferred hiccup converts it into the HTML that you expect, and similarly for CSS. And the reason this is good is because it's tangible, it's fungible. I can take this data structure and I can manipulate it. And as closure programmers, we love manipulating data. That's what we do. That's, that's what we live and breathe. And everybody just, it's super trivial. And closure makes it super, super trivial to work with. And so having these things as data structures rather than some strings and some compiler, like whatever, um, it's super, super easy to work with. And so we're seeing this more and more. More and more libraries are trying to turn to this way of um, describing the functionality that you want from the library just as data structures that you can either just write out by hand or you can write and manipulate, write and manipulate, and then pass it off to the library. An example of this is Composure, which was the solution for doing HTTP routing, um, which was heavily, like in 2008 when it came out, it's still one of the most popular ones, and it relies on using macros and functions, but once you write it, you can't, you can't do anything with it. It just gives you a function. But now libraries, instead, have come out that do it in a data structured way. Now, if you say, you know, why is data better than code? Like I said, it's tangible. You can work with it. I recommend the talk Transparency Through Data by James Reeves, um, which is worth watching, and he spends another 40 minutes talking about it. <laughs> OK, we're going to have to cut it up. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, and uh, just a reminder, you know, when we think about closure, it's functional, it's data-driven, but lastly, it's also pragmatic. These are the ideals. We want the, the ideals are functional programming, pure functions. The ideals are using data as much as possible, but in reality, sometimes the world gets in the way and problems are hard, so you can use stateful things as well. But we just try to optimize for functional programming and data-driven programming. Thank you. <laughs>